My name's Rhys Gordon. I'm a tattoo artist of 27 years now. This is my studio, Little Tokyo, in Surrey Hills in Sydney. Sitting in here is like a labour of love for me. This is the Australian Tattoo History Museum. And behind me are a display of original sheets from a guy called Bob Wood from 1973. A good friend of mine came over from the UK about two years ago, a guy called Lal Hardy. He's kind of the godfather of London tattooing. And he'd been corresponding with a lot of people in Australia over the years, like Cindy Ray for one, another guy, Greg Ardren. So basically we went around and visited all these people, little tattoo tour, and he said to me, mate, Australia's got such a good history, like no one's really documenting it. I think, you know, you should, because I'm kind of in the middle. I'm too young for the old guys and I'm too old for the younger guys. So I can kind of have a foot in each world. And thankfully the older guys, I think, understand that my heart's in the right place so they've opened up a lot of doors for me and they know that you know I'm trying to document our history so I was just able to get hold of a lot of Bob stuff he was such a prolific guy over his career and this is just a small section of what he's got I've got other sheets from the late 70s 80s and 90s machines photos stencils like a, a big collection of his stuff basically just trying to preserve Australia's tattoo history and celebrate you know what the forefathers here did. To me, it's important because tattooing has given me a great life. And in a lot of other industries in the world or just life in general, people just want to take, take, take. There's a good saying, if you're good to tattooing, it will be good to you. Without getting too romantic, I believe everything I'm doing like this is all good karma for me and good karma for the industry. Tattooing's going through such a huge change at the moment as far as technical aspects like machines, needles, colours, designs. You know, I think people need to know where they come from. Say some young kid picks up a Fender Stratocaster and just pretends Jimi Hendrix never existed. You know, you're kind of a fool and you don't really grasp the full magnitude of, of what's in your hands or what you're doing or what you're a part of. To be a well-grounded artist, I think it's important to have at least some idea of where you come from. And that will mean that, you know, if you're talking to a peer or a customer asks you a question, you, you don't want to come across like an uninformed fool. This is Bob's legacy. Artists tattooing today, except for maybe Japanese traditional, they're the ones still holding firm to doing watercolour paintings and producing maybe more artwork as a hard copy on paper than other aspects of the tattoo industry. Say for example, a, a realism artist, like he's not gonna be able to leave behind this sort of stuff. It's all gonna be on an online format. So there's nothing something that someone can actually grasp or look at and cherish and be inspired by. And you know, even just the processes of the tattooing. Tattooers now don't know how to tune a machine don't know how to make needles, don't know how to mix ink. So back in this era, your understanding of the craft was a direct correlation to your ability, to your skill. If you were a shit drawer and you were a shit mechanic, you did shit tattoos. These days, you can be a shit drawer, you can be a shit mechanic, and you can do amazing tattoos. These are the pioneers. We're standing on the shoulders of giants, so to speak. You know, they did it when it wasn't cool, when it wasn't trendy, when they were actual outcasts from society. You know, from a day where you'd see a heavily tattooed person, general public, yeah, would like look away, where now it's like, oh wow, man, cool colours. Which is not a bad thing. You know, it's as mainstream as it's ever been, and that's great. And, and you know, all these new artists that are in the industry is great as well. It's just helping take it to a whole new level. Sailor Jerry had a pretty good connection with Australia, a guy called Des Connolly down in Melbourne. He ran um, the Australian Tattoo Museum, also the Australian Tattoo Club. Des went to Hawaii at one of the first meetings with Ed Hardy. Through Des, Sailor Jerry was able to get hold of some of his famous colour. Um, there's a guy called Wally Hammond here in Sydney. He was like worldwide renowned back in the day for his pigment. If you were able to get hold of his stuff, your tattooing was instantly better. Des also helped Sailor Jerry cast his machines. His bulldog machines were cast here in Australia. And apparently there's supposedly urban legend is there's a 44 gallon drum somewhere sitting in someone's garage full of all of these machine blanks. So if someone was to come across those, you know, they'd probably be a very rich man. These are quite crude compared to Sailor Jerry's designs. You know, he was able to refine them, make them smoother, sleeker, drop things out. They were efficient tattoos to do that stood the test of time. There were really no extra bells and whistles to them. 
I was just clean, solid tattooing. His machines were world-class. He had world-class color. He worked out what was called the sterile chain of events, which means, you know, sterilization. And the thing that's, you know, like a few people around the world of that era, he didn't have to. You know, he could have just kept tattooing, making the same amount of money as the guy down the street, but he went the extra mile because he wanted to. He wanted to give something to it and, and like rise above. You know, he wanted to be the cream, which he did. And, and you know, his legacy is living on. Mm -hmm.